our government. Uh, so then what has happened to B? B has got A and C flanking it, but A and C are not equivalent. So this will split, this will split, this will give me a doublet, this will give me a doublet, and therefore technically I must be looking at the possibility of C, a doublet of a doublet for B. So one proton of B must give me a doublet of of a doublet, just like the three diagrams we wrote for there. What about C? What will C give you? Yeah, there's a doublet that this can give me, and this can give me a, a quartet, and therefore I should be getting something like a doublet of a quartet, or inversely, a quartet of a doublet. It all depends on which coupling is stronger. Remember I told you yesterday, you first take the stronger coupling and you first couple that, split it. Then take the weaker one and do the next generation. So if the doublet, if this coupling is very strong with this, rather than this, what would you do? First you take the doublet and then bring in the, the, the three protons to give me the quartet. So in which case I would say it's a quartet of a doublet. But if this couples strongly with this and this is weaker, first I take this one and I get my quartet first. And each of these quartet signals will then be split by this proton into a doublet, in which case I will say it's a doublet of a quartet. So if I, in the exam, tell you that this coupling is stronger and this coupling is weaker relatively, so give me the structure of that LMR spectrum. You have to tell me that this is stronger, I take this first, get a doublet, and then I get a quartet of a doublet. If I say this is stronger, first I get a quartet, and then I get a doublet of a quartet. So the order in which you take them will actually be decided by which of the two couplings is stronger relative to the other. In case I don't give you anything, I just tell you, give me the structure of this LMR spectrum for this molecule, then I expect you to tell me, I'm assuming that this is stronger than this, therefore I got this. You have to write a statement for me, because that is what tells me that you've understood this basic concept. That you take the stronger coupling first and then the weaker coupling later. That's what that's how you handle most problems in quantum mechanics, in fact. You first take care of all the strong ones and then you add on the weak ones as perturbations to the results that you got by looking at the stronger interaction first. So that's basically what it is. So whenever you are asked for the, the appearance of the LMR spectrum for a given molecule, you have to look at am I looking at neighboring protons, are they all equivalent or non-equivalent? If they are non-equivalent, then of course it's going to be a doublet of a quartet or a quartet of a doublet and so on. But if they are all equivalent protons, it's somewhat simple. If I have n equivalent protons, it's simply n plus 1. And we saw why that is the case. But what I even said was, sometimes this coupling and this coupling, you know, we just happen to be the same. And you have seen this in other cases. For example, you remember I talked to you about uh, carbon dioxide, Fermi resonance in carbon dioxide. How did that happen? You had the symmetric stretch at a certain place, around 2300 or thereabout, and then you had the 667 of the bend, and two quanta of that actually came very close to 1230. Now, there is absolutely no earthly reason as to why two quanta of a bend must come close to the symmetric stretch of the uh, carbon dioxide. It just happens to be that. We call these situations as accidental degeneracies. Just a sheer accident. Twice of this happens to be equal to this and when that happens, you suddenly have complications in terms of Fermi resonance and so on. Same thing can happen over here. For no earthly reason, the coupling of this and this, when I say no earthly reason, of course there's a reason, but what I'm saying is there's no logical, simple reason. You know, if you go back and start calculating electron density and therefore calculating coupling constants, you'll eventually find that, yeah, when you calculate it, it turns out to be equal by chance. What I'm saying is there's nothing by symmetry, nothing by a sheer observation, that you can say that this has to be equal to this. Why do I say, for example, in this molecule, this coupling has to be the same as this coupling? Because this proton and this proton are related by symmetry. And therefore, there's a very obvious reason I can bring out to tell you, that look, this and this have to come equally with this. But there is no such symmetry argument I can actually employ to say that this and this must couple and have the same values. So, to a first approximation, we expect them to be different. But there can be situations 
in which accidentally these couplings can be the same. If the couplings were to be the same, then what would happen? These are three, there's four, and how many peaks would you have? Just five peaks. But if that being a doublet of a quartet, which is what you told me in the first place, and the couplings were not the same, how many peaks would I get? Eight. So if suddenly these were equal, then they become five peaks. Now if you look at the other aspect and see five peaks, what's the most logical conclusion you'll come up with? Well, there is some program that's got four neighboring equal and low dots. And you'll try to write a structure for this molecule with somehow bringing in four equal and neighboring protons, and you'll never find that's possible. And therefore, you then have to say, well, in this case, some of the couplings happen to be accidentally the same, and that's the reason why I have this problem. Okay. But as far as assignments or problems for you is concerned, we will not look at such weird situations of two different protons and two different chemical chips, non equal protons, happening to have the same coupling constant. No. So when I give you non equal protons, you can assume that their coupling constants are going to be different. And you can base your arguments on that particular uh, line of reasoning. So this is something that you want to keep in mind and be able to say how many peaks you would get for all these uh, situations. We will look at some spectra. In fact, in the, uh, one of the classes, maybe on Friday, I will do it, but in the health sessions that I'm planning to have, I will show you some spectra. I will show you some spectra right now in which we will look at these uh, situations. But in the health session, maybe I'll go through the effect all over again for those of you who are still not clear. We'll have one today, which will be at uh, 7 o'clock, after 6 o'clock class. You know, we just go freshen up and come back for the last. And then we will have a health session, roughly for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then every health session, we will decide whether you want to have one tomorrow or you want to have one day. And what I will do in the health session is I'll actually go through the problem sets I have given you, and I will simply go through that in great detail. So that any of you who are stuck and who can't see how to proceed can actually ask me as to how to handle it. So basically at this point in time what we have done is we looked at proton anima, we have looked at the reason for applying the magnetic field first, because we want to split the states, we have to dress the molecules up and get them ready for this excitation act, and then bring in radio frequency and make a transition from the lower state to the upper state. And then we also said that the extent of splitting is also the same as the Lama precession frequency. And that is how the energy is actually absorbed. And this Lama precession frequency, which is characteristic of the proton, a metal proton is different from a methylene proton, different from a hydroxyl proton, and that is what really saves the day for us when we look at an aspect. Since each of, the, each of these have different Lama precession frequencies, they all have different absorptions. And by looking at where they absorb, you can actually say what the we also saw the need for normalizing that spectrum in terms of the operating frequency of the machine and therefore we came up with the scale, a delta scale, which was the frequency of absorption for the proton in question minus the frequency for TMS divided by the frequency of the machine. So metal proton has a certain frequency. A metal proton and TMS has a certain frequency. You take the difference, you divide by the operating frequency of the machine, which could be 100 megahertz or 400 megahertz or so on, and then you come up with a number that is going to be independent of the feed of the machine that you are using. It doesn't matter whether it's 100 megahertz or 400 megahertz. One ppm, which is roughly where you expect to see the metal absorption, will always be one ppm, whether it is 400 megahertz or 100 megahertz or 600 megahertz. We also said, if the machine is 100 megahertz, what is 1 ppm equal to? 100 hertz. If it is 500 megahertz machine, 1 ppm would be, again, 500 hertz. So which means that the metal group is absorbing at 1 ppm, what does it mean? It simply means it is 100 hertz away from tetramethylene in a 100 megahertz machine. But it is 500 hertz away in a 500 hertz machine, 500 megahertz machine. But if I divide it by the operating frequency of the machine, it's always going to be the number one expressed in units of parts per million. And that's the reason why we did this. But what about the coupling constant? Is the coupling constant dependent on feed? No, the coupling constant is not dependent on feed. It's an intrinsic property. So if the two peaks are split by, let us say, 10 hertz, it is 10 hertz 
in any machine, in this 10 hertz and 500 megahertz, this 10 hertz and 100 megahertz, or what have you. But the coupling constant is independent of the feed, but the normal precession frequency, that is dependent on the feed. Because the moment you apply the feed, the molecule, the, the angular momentum starts to spin, and that spinning frequency depends on the feed you apply. But the coupling constant is independent of the feed, and you want to keep that in mind. If it is 5 hertz coupling constant, it's the same 5 hertz irrespective of what machine it is that you're going to be using. Okay. So that's sort of a quick roundup of what we did. Now I'll let show you some spectra, but before we look at some spectra, let's take a quick look as to what proton or what nuclei can actually be seen in an NMR experiment? What nuclei can actually be seen in an NMR experiment? We simply said proton has a spin i equal to half and therefore it can be seen. Any nuclei with spin i equal to half therefore can also be seen. Carbon 13 has how many protons? 6 protons and 7 neutrons. Has a spin i equal to 1 half. Just like hydrogen. And therefore, when you apply a magnetic field, what will happen to the states? Plus half, minus half. And therefore, every other argument that you now have will simply follow. Yeah. There's no way you can capture die by any simple minded argument. Because it has to do with the, uh, the, the structure of the, the strong shell structure that you have in the nucleus, which is not very well understood yet. We have various models, but that doesn't tell us. So the way I is actually got for most nucleus through experiments. That's the best way to do it. Because you will find that seven protons and six six protons, every time you have even numbers, it turns out they get paired. And therefore they do not contribute for spin. Every time you have unpaired stuff, like in this case, there's one neutron that's left unpaired, therefore you have I equal to half. So take boron 10 for example. Five neutrons. 5 protons, what would therefore happen? You have an unpaired situation here, you have an unpaired situation here and therefore you will find, you would expect this to be an integer, that's all I can tell you. Actually if you go back and look at boron, I think it's spin is 3. If you take boron lemon, boron lemon would be what? 5 protons and 6 neutrons. This will get paired, this will not get paired, and boron level I think is 3 by half, 3 by 2. So there's no clear way by which you can say, okay, if I know the number of protons, I know the number of neutrons, I can give you a value of y. Simply because, just like an electron, you know, I can have a shell structure, and if I know the electronic configuration, I can tell you what the spin of that situation is going to be, or that you know, element is going to be. However, in the case of nuclei, it's not a straight form. You would think that since I have one unpaired proton, it should be half. It's not the case. So the way this is done over here is to actually do the experiment. What will happen if i equal to 1? If i equal to 1, what will happen to the splitting? What are the m values for i equal to 1? If i, for i equal to 1, I mean 1 half, the m values for plus half and minus half. For i equal to 1, what would be the values? 1, 0 and minus 1. Mm -hmm. That's 1, 0 and minus 1. Therefore, the states would be plus 1, 0, minus 1. We didn't talk about the selection rule in the hydrogen in the nuclei proton case. Why? We have only two states, and we just assume that this can jump from here to here, but again, there's a selection rule. It turns out that the delta and my value must be 1. But then going from a plus half to a minus half actually is a change of one quantum number. And therefore, the transition was allowed. So now if you apply this rule over here, what are the transitions allowed in this case? This can go to this, which is plus 1, or this can go to this, low 4, 1, 2, you will change in the quantum number. Therefore, how many transitions will I now have for an i equal to 1 case? Two transitions. And of course, I'm going to have this, these are all so, so small in energy spacing that you always find population in all of them. And therefore, you must be able to jump from here to here and here to here. So unlike for the bare proton case, 
We only have one transition going from plus half to a minus half. In this case, how many transitions would I get? Plus one going to a zero and zero going to a minus one. This one. Therefore, I have two transitions. The moment I have two transitions, I know experimentally I have determined what the I value of the nucleus must be. It must be one. In case there have been three halves, like in the case of boron 11, how many peaks or how many levels would I get when I apply the magnetic field? Three half, one half, minus one half, minus three half. So how what are the possible transitions I'm going to get in this case? Given the condition that it must be delta i plus minus one. I can jump from here to here. I can jump from here to here. I can jump from here to here. Therefore, I have three transitions. But the moment I have three transitions, what do I immediately know? It's a four level system. And if it's a four level system, it has to be a three half situation. Therefore, experimentally, these are very well determined. But if you ask for a, a theoretical es uh, explanation for this, there is no simple minded theoretical explanation that what you have for electrons. Because for electrons, if I gave you the shell structure, we understand the shell structure thoroughly. And therefore, we are in a position to tell you what the spin of the situation is going to be, spin of the element is going to be, once I know the electronic configuration. Here, all I can tell you is, given the proton count and the neutron count, whether I will have a half integral spin, integral spin, or no spin. That's basically what I will be able to take. Yeah. Did I answer the question? Or you forgot the question? Okay. Okay. So, uh, if I have, in, in the case of proton, how many hydrogen, take the case of hydrogen, how many protons do I have? One proton. How many neutrons do I have? Zero neutrons. So I have an odd proton and an even neutron, with a zero zero thing. Odd proton and even neutron.